Значит, сейчас э, я попрошу выступить э, Николаса Гриффина. Он представляет в Европейском парламенте часть английского общества. Пожалуйста, вам слово. Every year the Russian Foreign Ministry publishes this thick report on human rights violations in the European Union. The survey is valuable and appears at first sight to be a comprehensive record of human rights violations which are featured in the mainstream press of the countries covered, which of course include Britain, Germany and France. У меня в руках, теперь уже на столе, толстый отчет, ежегодный отчет Российского Министерства иностранных дел. Отчет по э, касательно нарушений прав человека в Европе. На первый взгляд это очень авторитетное, очень ценное всестороннее исследование нарушения прав в Европе, в том числе в таких странах, как Германия, Британия и Франция. And thereby hangs the problem, because the vast majority of the Western capitalist and state media are effectively controlled by small cliques of like-minded bourgeois Trotskyites neocon corporate bosses and Zionists. Но вся проблема в том, что большинство средств массовой информации, на основе которых и пишется этот отчет, большинство средств массовой информации, как частных, так и государственных на Западе, принадлежит небольшой сплоченной клике людей троцкистского толка, неоколонизаторов и либералов. Collectively, these people tend to sympathize with and to report on problems encountered by those subgroups within society with whom, in the final analysis, they tend to identify. Thus, for example, militant homosexuals, far-left critics of big business, radical ecologists and immigrants' rights campaigners may at times step outside the boundaries of acceptable, acceptable behaviour and find themselves at odds with the law. But in the end, their fundamental values and aims do not clash radically with those of the ruling political elites and their law enforcement agencies. Such groups have, in effect, a license to rebel. Thus, if they do happen to go too far and fall foul of the bureaucracy, police and courts in the West, the media generally cover their resulting problems and they duly end up in the Russian Foreign Ministry report. But in any society, freedom and the presence or absence of respect for human rights cannot be measured accurately by what happens to those with whom the ruling elite tend to agree in terms of eventual aims, if not the means by which they seek to attain them. No, the only proper way to assess the state of human rights is to look at what happens to those with whom the regime radically disagrees. Unfortunately, this is no easy task, because the incestuous relationship between the political and media elites in the West means that certain kinds of dissident, the rebels with an unlicensed cause, are effectively non-persons. When they are persecuted and denied their human rights, their cases are simply shoved down an Orwellian memory hole. Thus, a review of human rights violations in the West, which relies on the mainstream media for most of its information, automatically and drastically underestimates the full extent of the problem and the breathtaking hypocrisy of Western Trotskyites, liberals and neocons when they attack Russia over alleged violations of human rights. I will give three specific examples. The right to deny the existence of God, to blaspheme and to level grotesque insults at the church and believers is, of course, upheld rigorously in most Western countries. As you know, the prosecution and jailing of Pussy Riot became a cause celebre for every Trotskyite, liberal, globalist and Zionist with an axe to grind against Russia and President Putin. Young Germans, or Britons by contrast, could prance around the high altar of any German or British cathedral and insult and degrade Christianity to their heart's content. No one would stop them, let alone punish them. In fact, they would probably be awarded first prize in a trendy art exhibition. Yet in truth, This fact is not a reflection on Western tolerance. Rather, it merely tells us what the, the, what the West no longer regards as holy and thus does not care to protect. By contrast, let a group of young Germans put on an irreverent hollow riot performance at the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. 
and see how, it, how long it takes before they will be carted away by the police on permanent guard. How long would they get in prison for the thought crime known as Holocaust denial? Well, consider the penalties meted out to those who have questioned this new secular Western pseudo religion of the Holocaust, not in a vulgar, provocative, pussy riot fashion, but using scientific analysis and the techniques of standard historical debate. Ernst Zundel, a pacifist campaigner for an end to the concept of inherited guilt for ethnic Germans, held in solitary confinement in a Canadian prison cell for two years without the light ever being switched off, then imprisoned in Germany for five years. In Austria, engineer Wolfgang Froelich is today in prison serving a six-year sentence for stating his belief that certain eyewitness accounts of homicidal gassings are physically impossible. Horst Mahler, a 73-year-old German lawyer, found guilty of Holocaust denial in 2009 and thrown into prison for 12 years, a term which at his age could easily be a whole life sentence. Over the last decade or so, literally thousands of prisoners of conscience have been arrested, imprisoned and stripped of professional qualifications in free democratic Germany and the other dozen EU states that have passed laws to criminalise the questioning of accepted history for this, for this thought crime. Not for vandalism or hooliganism, but for words they have written or spoken peacefully. They may be mistaken, but even if they are, is it not a human right to be wrong in the eyes of the state? And is not the claim of a state to be infallible on a question of opinion one of the early warning signs of totalitarianism and oppression of the freedom of the individual. I am not arguing that this revisionist interpretation of the Nazi persecution of the Jews is correct. Indeed, were I to do so here in Moscow today, I would be liable the minute I'd set foot in any EU state to be arrested and shipped off to Germany, where I would face a trial in which my lawyer would in turn be liable to arrest and imprisonment if he was rash enough to try to explain, let alone excuse, what I said. So let me say that I believe unquestioningly every last detail of the unquestionable Holocaust story. But I will also say that I believe that it is the most rank hypocrisy for Western politicians and journalists to condemn Russia for defending the dignity of the Christian Church, while applauding or ignoring the persecution of thousands who offend the dignity of the Jewish Holocaust. A similar hypocrisy may be seen in hostile Western coverage of Russia's strict laws to protect orphans from being adopted by rich Westerners. The rumbling scandal of the paedophile rings that infest many Western political parties and the clear ideological and self-interest links between such criminal perversion and campaigns for ever more aggressive gay rights legislation are matters which my colleague Mr Fiore has already covered. I will therefore restrict my observations on the rights of parents and young children in the West to the question of the forced snatching of literally thousands of children every year by local government social services departments in Britain alone, with a similar pic picture emerging right across Western Europe. This is a scandal that has been going on for years, breaking up hundreds of thousands of families. Exact figures of how many are affected are not available, but it is estimated that there are more than half a million children in care in the UK alone. These children are placed in institutions dominated by sexual abuse and bullying, or fostered with families of varying degrees of suitability. The staggering 10,000 British children seized from their parents are simply lost in the system every year. It gets worse. Many of those children kidnapped by the state are taken not because they're being beaten or abused, but on the grounds that social services workers tell a court that they may be at risk of future emotional harm. In other words, loving families are broken up on account of the totally subjective opinion of small cliques of left-wing anti-family experts who have quotas for the number of children they must snatch and who receive financial bonuses for meeting those quotas. Ominously, when speaking to families victimised in this way, a common theme keeps emerging. Good-looking children are far more likely to be targeted than plain ones. 
Is this because they're more adoptable or because they're more attractive to pedophiles? Last month, I spent several hours looking over court papers with a woman, Mrs. Antonia McLeod, whose four healthy, happy children, Cody, Riley, Lacey and Lady Marie, have been taken into care and put up for adoption, despite her being recorded as being a good mother with whom her children are safe and wish to stay. Her crime, in the eyes of the British state, holding politically incorrect views, critical of radical Islam and immigration, which could lead to the children being radicalised when older. That is what the judge's order says. I've seen it for myself. More incredible still, Antonia was at one stage told that the fact that her then husband was a serving soldier meant that he could be posted again to Afghanistan and killed in action, a possible event which poses a risk of future emotional harm. I have spoken personally with members not just of the indigenous Christian community, but also with Sikhs and Shia Muslims about the clear tendency of the social services child snatchers to place children from their communities either with gay or with fundamentalist Sunni Muslim foster parents. In addition to being a massive attack on the human rights of the parents and children, this can also be interpreted as contravening the United Nations Convention on Genocide through creating conditions in which the children of the groups in question are forcibly cut off from their heritage. The vast majority of those affected by this state-run child snatching are, however, white working class families. As such, they belong to a section of the population which attracts little attention and even less sympathy than the bourgeois left liberals and vociferous rainbow coalition minorities who dominate journalism. As a result, this scandal receives next to no coverage in the media, with the honourable exception of one traditionalist writer in the Daily Telegraph, Christopher Booker, who continues to wage a lonely one-man crusade for the basic human right of loving families to stay together. My final example, I draw your, I draw your attention to the extraordinary scenes in Paris earlier this year, when peaceful pro-family protesters, demonstrating for the right of children to have a mother and a father, were brutally attacked by the police. Around a million people, including large numbers of families, including babies in prams and toddlers, were subjected to repeated baton charges and fusillades of tear gas. But because they were there to register their Christian objection to the socialist government's cultural revolution on behalf of militant homosexuals, the mainstream media airbrushed the, culture, the unprovoked and sustained assaults out of the record. Imagine the fuss if a million gay rights militants were battened and tear gas on the streets of Moscow. It would be worldwide news. <coughs> but when it happens in Paris, the peaceful, heterosexual, traditionalist families, no one even hears about. This, then, is the reality of human rights in countries such as France, Britain and Germany. Favoured minorities have rights, often enforced by the might of the state, and if those rights are infringed, the media will tell everyone about it. But if you're indigenous, if you are a traditionalist, and especially if you are a Christian, your rights count for next to nothing. And if they are smashed into a thousand pieces, the media will either ignore it or say you deserved it. So you must pay your taxes, Send your sons to die in neocon wars and shut up, or else. Russia should take note, because the evils we are telling you about today are not happening by accident. They are part of a long-standing war of cultural and ethnic destruction being waged against all the peoples of Europe. You are the last bastion of European civilization, and therefore the biggest future target for the nation records. Special Bourgeois. Constitution. В данный момент, и, собственно, тут э, можно сказать, почему э, Артемис приехал один, а не э, приехал в Генсекретарь партии. В данный момент Генсекретарь партии находится в заключении вместе с двумя другими членами Золотой Зари. Но, естественно, нас это не останавливает. Мы продолжаем нашу деятельность, готовимся к следующим выборам с единственной главной целью – конституционный 
мирный политический захват власти, отъем ее у нынешнего предательского правительства. That's the only way Greeks will be the masters of their country and they won't live under the constant fear of the crimes of the illegal immigrants. And in order to make this a reality, the Greeks must have a nationalist government which will bring an end to the illegal immigration, stop the economical occupation and bring to an end the moral and cultural decline while protecting our national values at any cost. Несомненно, только национальное правительство сможет дать грекам свободную страну, сможет избавить их от страха перед нелегальными мигрантами, сможет противостоять агрессии на экономическом уровне. In this fight, Europe must stay united because all the nations are facing the same problems. The younger generation of Europe resents their governments that seek their nations in decay. The time has come to uh, has come that all Europe must be united against the common enemy in order to make Europe a healthy coalition of states that all benefit from solidarity and mutual understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, I would say that uh, with the end of the European community, we will have the beginning of a new Christian and civilized Europe. I will say that with the end of a uh, capitalist bank center, economics in Europe and the world, we will finally see the beginning of a social and uh, rich um, Europe uh, within the world. So basically we are witnessing the, uh, uh, the sunset of, a, not of a civilization, we are witnessing the sunset of an uh, absurd creation, which is European community, which is based on liberal Freemasonic, anti-family, anti-national, and anti-union <coughs> values, and we are witnessing, hopefully, and I think this is my belief, uh, together with Russia, the beginning of a new Europe. Поблагодарить наших э, европейских э, друзей, э, первое и главное, за их э, любовь к России, э, к нашей внешней политике, за их поддержку и в Европейском парламенте, и у себя на родине, э, тех усилий, которые наша страна э, со с ее скромными возможностями э, делает на международной арене. И нам это очень приятно, и действительно это огромное спасибо вам. Но, но в качестве вот э, такого искрометного ответа на вашу оценку России и, так сказать, просьба, чтобы мы что-то тоже делали и понимали не только то, что пишут в газетах про Европу западную, но вот эти глубинные процессы, более значимые процессы, о которых вы рассказали. Я хочу вам э, ответить, что вот передо мной есть доклад, 66 страниц. Этот доклад подготовлен э, тремя учеными. Это профессор Понкин, профессор Михалева и профессор Кузнецов. Он называется, этот доклад называется о нарушении прав детей при их усыновлении кавычках, гомосексуальными союзами, в скобках, однополыми партнерствами. Вот этот доклад а, мы по крупинкам, буквально по крупинкам, по песчинкам собрали по официальным публикациям в Западной Европе. По оценкам ученых, правильно настроенных, так сказать, не с искаженным взглядом на семью, на ребенка, на женщину и так далее. По крупинкам собрали. Собрали опыт Европейского суда по правам человека. Оказывается, там тоже есть в судебных решениях несколько положительных моментов. 
И здесь э, национальные судебные решения некоторые. Большая доктрина, как я сказал, да? И самое главное, анализ примерно 40 международных конвенций. 40 международных конвенций. Где мы доказываем, мы доказали, я надеюсь, что мы с правовой точки зрения доказали, что усыновление двойками, мы их называем двойки, вот эти гомосексуальные пары, мы здесь их называем двойки, детей является преступлением, не только морально-нравственным, что это ясно сидящим здесь, но это преступление и юридическое. И мы даем конкретные факты, ссылки на конкретные судебные решения, на, кон на конкретные статьи, нормы международных соглашений, которые противоречат той политике, о которой вы так ярко сегодня рассказали, донесли до нас. Конечно, здесь все говорить невозможно, но последнюю страницу я зачитаю выводы, которые э, сделаны в этом докладе. Кстати, этот доклад является вторым уже большим фундаментальным исследованием, которое мы делали в том числе по просьбе Русской Православной Церкви, прежде всего, но и также нашего представителя в Европейском суде по правам человека от церкви, где эти проблемы очень остро сейчас стоят. Мы видели, как остро они стоят везде, потому что дети лишаются вообще детства. Миллионы. Я первый раз слышал, что 500 тысяч, он сказал. Да, 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 Украины, только. детей фактически. Спасибо. Вот. А, и а, предшествующий наш доклад против а, гей-парадов и вообще гомосексуализма, он переведен на итальянский, на французский язык и опубликован а, 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 в Италии, во Франции. И этот а, доклад тоже сейчас заканчивается его перевод на английский язык, на французский уже переведен, и он тоже будет опубликован. Ну, на сайте Патриархии он уже висит у нас, но а, на языке еще а, пока не подготовлен, то есть это свежие данные. И вот выводы этого доклада. Выводы, установленные государством, в национальном законодательстве возможности гомосексуального усыновления детей неправомерно, не имеет убедительных юридических и фактических оснований, основывается на заведомо неверной, искаженной интерпретации общепризнанных принципов и норм международного права, международных документов о правах человека, грубо противоречит фундаментальным правам и законным интересам ребенка, гарантированным международным правом. Второе. Гомосексуальное усыновление в кавычках ребенка влечет грубейшие нарушения следующих фундаментальных естественных прав ребенка. Я перечислю эти права. Право ребенка на семью грубо нарушается. Право ребенка на мать и отца. Право ребенка на свою половую идентичность и половую самоидентификацию и половую неприкосновенность. Нарушается права ребенка на собственные убеждения и нравственно-этические установки. Право, прав ребенка... Нарушается право ребенка на полноценное развитие и на охрану его психического и нравственного здоровья. Права ребенка на национально-культурную идентичность и на приобщение к родной культуре. Третье. Гомосексуальное усыновление ребенка не может быть признано надлежащей формой реализации прав ребенка на семью. Его право на мать и на отца, а равно лиц их замещающих, приемных родителей, и на заботу с их стороны. Четвертое. Государство в случае установления им правовой возможности гомосексуального усыновления детей выходит за пределы своих полномочий и по сути совершает неправомерные деяния, 
противоречащие фундаментальным принципам демократического правового государства. Пятое, последнее. Заявления и действия некоторых международных и иностранных организаций фактически направлены на навязывание суверенным государствам принятие ими решений об установлении правовой возможности государственной регистрации устойчивых гомосексуальных союзов в качестве брака в кавычках и установление правовых возможностей установление в кавычках такими гомосексуальными союзами детей противоречит нормам международного права о защите детей. В докладе примерно полтора десятка конвенций и конкретных ссылок на статьи, которые были в более здоровые времена после войны приняты. 50-е, 60-е, 70-е годы. Все это нарушается сейчас. Значит, международного права о защите детей и международно правовому принципу приоритета прав и законных интересов детей способствует грубым нарушениям фундаментальных прав и законных интересов детей, а также влекут существенные негативные последствия для здоровья и развития детей, общественной нравственности, демографической безопасности государства. Вот краткие выводы по итогам этого исследования.